Hi, my name is Andrew Nemec. I'm with The Oregonian and Oregon Live. I'm joined by Oregon High School football guru, Jordan Johnson. And Jordan, I want to get into it right away and talk about Justin Herbert. Um, he was your guy for a long time. For a year and a half, you said Sheldon High School quarterback Justin Herbert is going to blow up on the recruiting scene. He's going to be big time. He just got an offer from Oregon. I can't imagine you could get a much bigger offer as a quarterback than Oregon. What made you believe in him, and what does he bring to the table? A lot of people don't know about him. He's a no-star recruit on some sites. Yeah, I mean, last year, the, through two and a half games, 10 touchdowns, no picks, he dominated um, pretty much every snap. And one of those kids that when you see him play, whether it's football, baseball, basketball, he just has that it factor. I mean, he, I think, you know, Nevada offered last week, and he had some big skies, but Oregon knew, I think, that was going to be a kid that they were going to go on, just, you know, it was a matter of time. So with Justin, you know, at 6'6", 220, there are certain things you just can't teach. And he brings so much to the table on and off the field. His father, um, you know, a D1 guy. His brother, Mitch, is at Montana State, one of the best D1 AA receivers in the country. Started as a freshman, led the state of Oregon in receiving yards um, two years ago. And overall, just a phenomenal athlete, um, as is Justin. So I think for him, um, the commitment was a pretty easy decision. You know, a hometown Ducks, he's been – going to duck, duck games his whole life, and um, I think they both scored with uh, his commitment. One of the things that really interests me, Justin, was, was just that, that he was so hot to start his junior year, and, and you said through two and a half games. The reason he only played two and a half games, he broke his leg. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this was an interesting recruiting year on the West Coast because of the top 20 dual threat quarterbacks in the country, none were from west of Texas. So Oregon knew they had to go across country to get a guy that fit their system. But I think there was that part of them in the back of their mind that this Justin Herbert kid might be special, and even if we whiff, we're going to get this diamond in the rough. And I, and I think he's shown early this year that he's not really a diamond in the rough. He really is talented. I mean, he's now a three-star on 24-7 sports. They said they did an evaluation of him that wasn't just – the Oregon boost, that he, he's a legit three-star. I think he's a four-star talent. And I, I don't think this is a Taylor Alley situation where he only starts if things fall apart. I think he legitimately could be a multi-year starter for Oregon and a really good one. He makes all the throws. You watch him play in a high school football game, and he makes college throws. He has college arm strength. And then people think 6'5", 220, and they think former Oregon quarterback Brady Leaf, this statue back there. He's not like that. He's very mobile. He's had games where he's run for 100 yards. And I, I know that he took his commitment really seriously. He took, he took it upon himself to prove that he was an Oregon guy right away. And you saw that. I believe it was Friday they played. Um, some of the games were Thursday. He had three passing touchdowns and a rushing touchdown in the first quarter. So he, so he was making a statement right off the bat. Yeah, uh, I mean, up and down the board, he's he's hitting 400 on the baseball field. He's got a 1.98 ERA, three state championships, uh, football, baseball, basketball, um, playing in them. And I just I think with Justin, um, him and Sam Neuer are the clear one and two QBs in this class. Sam committed to, to Colorado, and even though that happened a little earlier, I think we all thought you and I talked about it. As good as Sam is, I love Sam. Justin is is a dude, it just took a little longer because he did get hurt last year. They wanted to see where he was at, how, how he did through the first five or six games. And I think, you know, just watching him play, it speaks for itself. His numbers, 65% passing, 16 TDs, two interceptions. Over the last two years, 26 TDs, two interceptions. It's incredible. Yeah, just a very um, – and, and Sheldon's a, a phenomenal program. It fits, it fits him and – those guys he's playing with, they have a very, very young team. Sheldon's a young group. He's a senior, and they got a few other seniors, but most of those kids are coming back. So he's leading a young group. As we talked about, the Stroms are gone. That's the first time in, like, seven years or whatever. Right. You know? So um, I, think, I think Justin is going to be a dude. He'll start for a couple years at Oregon. I think he'll do really well. We talk about – dude qualities and a, it's a it's a funny term that that Trent Dilford I don't I mean he obviously didn't start dude but that's one of the things he talks about at the Elite 11 he coaches the Elite 11 former uh Super Bowl winning quarterback for the Baltimore Ravens guys having dude qualities and that and that means leadership not the fake charisma but real genuine I run things 
uh, Justin Herbert has has DQ. He has dude qualities, and I, and I think it's really exciting that that he's a part of things. I know some Oregon fans thought, well, they lost a four star to get him. They had Seth Green committed. There are rumors, uh, including Justin Herbert himself, being told that. Seth Green is decommitted from Oregon, still not confirmed by Seth. So people think, well, they lost a four-star quarterback to get this unrated kid from Oregon. I don't actually think that's a fair assessment. Justin's now going to be a three- or four-star recruit. Seth, on the other hand, was a four-star guy rated last year based on potential. Really hasn't lived up to that, uh, unfortunately. He's been the backup at his high school. He came in um, two weeks ago and threw six passes, completed one, three were intercepted. Uh, So he threw three interceptions in six passes. Justin hasn't thrown three interceptions in two years. Mm -hmm. So in terms of accuracy, I think Justin has that on him. In terms of ability to make all the throws, Justin has that on him. So while Oregon fans are disappointed that they lost a four-star and gained a no-star, I actually think Justin's the more polished kid. That brings me kind of to my next point. Oregon now has four in-state commitments. They've got the two Central Catholic kids, Brady Breeze and Lamar Winston. Obviously, we've talked about Herbert quite a bit already. And then they've got Cam McCormick out of Summit. Oregon State has three in-state commitments, John Bates out of Lebanon, uh, Trevon Bradford from Oregon City, and Amani Robinson out of Gresham. So that's seven in-state commits to Oregon and Oregon State. Is this the deepest class the state's ever had? It's close. So you look at 2013, there was give or take 35, 40 D1 committed, D1 and D1 AA committed kids in those classes, which is unheard of in the state of Oregon if you take the history where we had five or ten kids committed to D1 universities. So it is definitely a top five program or top five class with regards to D1 kids. Well, it's, it's kind of a wait and see because we still have a lot of individuals with offers on the table that have not committed yet. And in the state of Oregon and the Northwest in general, a lot of offers and commitments will come late. The 10 guys that have committed are three, four-star type kids, and we know um, who they are. The other guys, we're looking at, you know, I think 16 to 20 of them with offers right now, and they've yet to make their commitment. So once the season plays itself out and the other guys, meaning kids throughout the country, make their commitments, we'll find out the, the, the relevancy with regards to total um, there. You brought up an interesting stat before we, before we started recording. Oregon has eight current in-state scholarship players. They're getting four commitments in just this class. Oregon State has six scholarship in-state players on the roster. They've already got pledges from three. Uh, I think they have a very good chance at landing Central Catholic offensive lineman Toby Okafor, and I'd be shocked if they didn't land Liberty linebacker Kalen Hemphill. So they could add five in-state commitments in this class. Again, they only have six on the entire roster. So to give you an idea of how deep this class is, we're stacking in one class almost as many as some of these programs have um, in, in four to five years with redshirt. It's, it's pretty incredible. Yeah, I think that Justin Herbert's a great example. No stars, no one knew about him, this and that. Well, who cares? I mean, the kid's the real deal. If you watch him, he now is a three or four star. But it's one of those things where I think Oregon State – Um, and Oregon have done a good job of going out and getting those top kids. Get your top four or five kids within within the state. I mean, they're going to know. I mean, they do this for a living, right? I mean, this kid, Brady Breeze, can play at Oregon and do well. Lamar Winston, Cam McCormick. I mean, these guys, Justin. So so I think they feel pretty comfortable um, with this. Now, the, the rest of the guys, these are the bubble kids that it's a wait and see. And, and, we'll, and we'll find out a little later down the road. But I think Oregon and Oregon State have done a good job of taking the initiative. We had, we had times where Oregon State wouldn't offer a single kid right. within the state of Oregon, which maybe is justified based on the talent, but it hurts from a, just a, you know, your in-state school not taking any, any of those kids. So depth-wise, a top-five class maybe ever in, in the state – after last year, a really down year where there was only a handful, is the state of Oregon getting better at football? As, as simple as that can be, is it getting better? And if so, why? Why now? I think it's a great question. I would say yes. I think uh, with regards to off-season activity, tournaments, players doing things to get themselves promoted more um, out on the seven-on-seven circuit at national events, 
I mean, that helps. This, this day and age, you got to get yourself out there. It's, it's, it's just the way it is. And we are seeing kids put in the time and um, make themselves relevant on a national stage. Brady Breeze was the first Oregon kid ever named first team all tournament at the national seven on seven tourney this last year. 120 teams participated in that. And our team Oregon group made the final four. As a whole, to do that, for all of the kids was a really, really big deal because it, it brought, it brought, you know, um, justification as to who we are in the Northwest. Look, this Oregon team made it to the final four, losing to defending national champion Bishop Gorman among 120 teams. And these are kids out of LA, Texas, Florida. I mean, very, very, very talented kids that people already know about. So I think to the crit, the kids and the family's credit, these people are doing a great job getting out, putting themselves out and saying, look, I can play with anyone. I'm going to go out and do this. And I, I think, you know, both the kids and the family should be commended for that. I, I think, too, it builds on itself in some ways. You've got now Steve Pine, who's had a number of kids go to the Pac-12. So a number of Pac-12 programs are familiar with him and his program. And I think as it's grown, more and more coaches now have connections with Pac-12 programs that say, hey, give this kid a look. And those programs are more willing to say, okay, <laughs> because they've given them a player before. So Tigard's got those connections. Central Catholic has those connections. Lake Oswego. Sheldon now has those connections. Having that establishes a rapport with coaches and establishes a trust with college coaches where they're more willing to say, if this coach tells me this kid's a Pac-12 player, I'm going to watch his film a little more carefully. And I, I think that's helped too. Absolutely. Don Johnson would be a, a prime example of that. He uh, now was the Madison head coach. Last year he was at Evergreen in Vancouver. Got out five D1 kids just last year. And that's from a, a team that went two and seven. So five Division One kids from a two and seven team in the Northwest. He is an individual. His father has been with the Chargers for the last 12 years. He was a, you know, a D1 guy, All-American. He knows when he, when he picks up the phone and calls some guy, he's not going to blow smoke. I mean, he's telling these guys, look, I got, I got a kid for you. So it's, it's uh, the, the individuals that you just mentioned and guys like Don Johnson that are, that are doing a great service to these kids and, and families and, and really helping um, put the Northwest on the map. And to your point earlier, you had said that, that tournaments were – were so important, and I, and I think there is definitely a level where that is. And you look at a guy, a perfect example is Trevon Bradford out of Oregon City. Really fast, really elite quickness for the state of Oregon, and I, and I think he got a little cocky. And I, I think he would say he got a little cocky during his junior year and took some plays off, it seemed like, had some quarters where he wasn't as consistent. And I think he thought he was elite. And he went to some of these national camps and realized that wasn't going to fly. Just, just being fast, just being quick wasn't enough. And I talked to him this summer, and he said he was in the weight room at 5.36 in the morning, five days a week. It shows he's added 10 or 15 pounds. He's improved his route running. He's catching the ball away from his body instead of letting it get up in on him and fight him a little bit. Uh, all of that has made him a much better receiver. And I don't think necessarily that, that he learned those skills away from high school football he just focused on them more because he realized he wasn't going to be able to get away with it in college and I think that's a huge piece too is these Oregon kids maybe Oregon's not as good as California and Washington it's it's probably not it's not but when they play those guys they realize man I'm gonna have to step it up just because I'm good in Oregon doesn't mean a whole lot and I think that national exposure has really helped a lot of kids yeah Trevon has all the talent in the world I think we would both agree with that I mean I'm biased I really really like Trevon just as a kid uh, he's always been one of my favorite athletes. But like you said, you can't just go to Oregon State and do what you did at Oregon City. I mean, completely different story. So what Trevon is doing, he's taking his uh, God-gifted talent and, and now really, really applying himself in the weight room and doing those extra things, which you would have to do either now or, or pretty soon here, uh, being that you're going to be in the Pac-12 next year. So to Trevon's credit, he went out on the national stage and tied for our team lead in touchdown receptions in Las Vegas at the national tourney. So Trevon's another kid that put himself out there. And to OSU's credit, they said, okay, look, I, you can play. We, we're going to be, we're going to show you some love early and, and give you the offer. And Trevon made a great decision in, in committing there. I want to go to a couple questions, then we'll, we'll wrap things up. G-Man 49ers, we addressed this a little bit, but G-Man 49ers asks, how does Oregon high school compare to, Oregon high school football compare to other states? Is it improving? Um, we touched on that a little bit, but I guess specifically, um, I still think it's behind Washington. I think Washington's really, I mean, Washington has a deeper pool of prospects, it seems like. I think the elite talents are now 
fairly equal from Oregon and Washington, although they, they have the number one kid in the country this year at quarterback, Jacob Eason. So this is a bad example for that. But I think in general, Oregon's elite and Washington's elite are similar, but the depth is a little better in Washington. They still don't compare to California, but I think they're getting more national respect. You're seeing more of the number one ranked 6A team being rated in the national top 50. That's happening more, meaning the depth at, each, at these elite programs is getting better. Is that how you see it, that, that Oregon is starting to gain on Washington and California? That being said, California will always be better. Washington, however, may not always be better. Yeah, so Washington, for example, has two and a half to one on numbers. So if you have two and a half times the amount of people that we have, you should have more recruits. Sure. I mean, so if, I, if I'm using that as, a, as an example, I think with regards to this class, 2016, we got 25 kids that have D1 offers right now. Um, we are doing very, very well in comparison to Washington based on the numbers. So I, I think it comes down to how many people do you have to, to, to select from, right? Right. Central Catholic being nationally ranked uh, the last couple of years, us, us having teams um, in the polls like that, I think, I think it all brings um, incredible relevancy to Oregon. And when you break it down by numbers, overall, I think we're doing pretty well. Walk right by asks the who the best underclassman is in the state of Oregon. Specifically, wants to know uh, what we think of Trey Lowe, obviously the younger brother of former Oregon receiver Keenan Lowe. Uh, the best underclassman is is a debate we've had on a previous podcast. Um, I think for the junior class, I don't think there's any doubt. I think it's Elijah Molden. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's a four star cornerback uh he can play running back but his future is at corner um his dad is alex molden who played in the nfl and and coaches at west lynn um offers from oregon stanford washington interest from florida state he's gonna have 20 25 30 offers uh sky is the limit for him could end up being a five-star talent was one of 12 or 13 juniors invited to the opening this year uh is that is that a fair do you think that's a fair assessment that, that he's the top junior in the state? Yeah, I think he'll go down as uh, probably the best DB ever to play in Oregon. Um, you know, we'll see where he decides to, to commit. But, yeah, I, I think definitely he's number one with regards to the 2017 class. Um, there's a couple other guys in there, obviously, that we've talked about. Connor Neville, Tim Tawa uh, from the quarterback spot. Marlon Tupilotu, who's got four offers. Uh, I mean, there's a there's a, a host of kids. Uh, Mason Elliott's got an offer over at Westview, the wide receiver. Um, so there's a bunch of kids, David Morris, Anthony Adams, that, you know, I'm, I'm a huge fan of, of both of those kids. And some guys, I'm pretty excited. This is, as the, the regular season cl- closes down, we start to see these 2017s get some well-deserved offers. So it's a pretty exciting time for, for that group. 2018 class has some special talents, too, and in, in – I'd hate not to mention them. Chase Coda is, I believe, the number three or four rated receiver in the country for his class. He's at South Medford, obviously the son of Chad Coda, another former Oregon legend, played with Alex Molden. Then uh, Lake Oswego offensive lineman Dawson Jaramillo rated the number 10 prospect in the country. Uh, he's definitely in the discussion. I think that's the big debate. Is it is it Dawson, who's not quite as polished, but has arguably the highest ceiling of any prospect since Colt Lyerla uh, in this state? Or is it Elijah Molden, the very polished technical corner that lacks that high-end 40 time but is almost a guaranteed no bust at college because he is so technically savvy? So I think that's the debate. Is, is Dawson or Elijah for the top prospect in the, in the state, underclassmen? Yeah, um, <laughs> no answer right now. Uh, Dawson, Dawson let's, let's give it one year with him sure. because I think uh, his, his line coach, Alex Cole, a guy he works with in, in the offseason, uh, referenced – what Dawson does this offseason in the weight room and just with adding that at that size, as talented as he is, just with his feet and the way he moves for a kid that that big, it's pretty incredible. I've never seen anything like it. Um, so, I mean, where he's at a year from now, he, he could have every, you know, have an offer from every school in the country. You know, he's, he's that good. So Elijah is a lockdown corner, one of the best players ever to play in Oregon, and I think Dawson will go down – um, he's only a sophomore, but it will go down as one of, if not the, you know, the best lineman to come out of here as well. We've talked about it a couple of times, and I just want to point out how incredible it is that this is a debate. Elijah allowed, as a sophomore, allowed one completion all of last year for four yards. Went on the national scene and did not allow a completion 
in the national seven-on-seven seven tournament against the best talent in the country does not allow a completion between his sophomore and junior year. That's how talented we're talking about Elijah Molden, an absolute lockdown corner. It, it was ridiculous. I hadn't seen – I mean, he was locking up six three, six four kids that used to doing whatever they wanted, and they were they – were, they were jabbing. They were, I mean, they were frustrated, visibly frustrated, because Elijah was just, it's incredible what he's able to do. I know Alex, his father, has really, really taught him well. And he's just learned so much that you can't learn from practice. And, and there's just certain things that, and, and to, to Elijah's credit, I mean, he's a guy with all these accolades and all this uh, notoriety. He goes every day to work. He grinds and he gets better every day. No one has to tell him that it's time to work. He does his thing. And that's why I think Elijah will get better and better at his every year throughout his collegiate career and, and potential professional career because he is, he's a grinder. Yeah, you have, you have kids that give up a completion and it's not, you know, they're frustrated, but it's not the end of the world. He knocks a ball down and is mad that he didn't open his hips sooner and needs to find out what he did wrong immediately, and he's angry. Mm -hmm. And he just made a great play, and he's still angry at himself because it wasn't perfect. So mm -hmm. that mentality, that lockdown mentality he's got. Yeah, it's uh, <clears throat> one of the best players that I've ever seen, and I think Elijah is going to be um, you know, definitely a five-star kid. If he, I think he's got him as a four-star, but he, he's a five-star kid in my eyes. Well, thank you, Jordan, for joining us. Um, talked a lot about Oregon, Oregon State, in-state recruiting, and hopefully we have you back on soon to, uh, to do this again. Appreciate it. Excellent.